Good morning, everyone, and um, I'd like to first thank uh, ST Property for inviting me to come and speak here today. Um, thank you for taking the time off on a Sunday to come and listen to all of us. Now, my topic is how to identify on-block opportunities in Singapore. Um, we know that the property market is now in a correction stage, and um, what's happened now is that really the only way to make money is to buy a a property that has got an on-block potential and to sit on it. We don't know when it's going to happen, but you know that there is definitely a capital gain there. Now, just a brief uh, story on Singapore. We're just a tiny little red dot. We gained independence on the 9th of August 1965 and we became a third world country to a first world country in less than 50 years. So that's quite a miracle. So in 1960, our population was only 1.6 million. In 2013, last year, as the census stand, it is now 5.4 million, and I believe today it is about 5.5. In 1960 also, our GDP was only 2,530. Today, it is $36,898. So as a result of this, Afflu growing affluence, our urban landscape has also changed tremendously. So this is just a trip down memory lane. This is Boat Key, and who would have expected that this slum would actually be a huge pot of gold for anyone who, has, who owns it. And this is Chinatown, also many pots of gold down there. How do we continue to reinvent our urban landscape? Now, what are our solutions? Since our population is projected to grow to up to 6.9 million by 2030, we will require some 766 square kilometers of land. Right now, we are only about 710 square kilometers. So to support this larger population, we have to reclaim land, develop some of our reserve land currently, and we do have some reserve lands like, you know, digging up the cemeteries and stuff like that. Um, we have to intensify new developments. So now you find that uh, most of the GLS sites that actually come onto the market have got quite uh, good intensities, um, up to uh, five even. And we, lastly, we have to further optimize and redevelop land that is currently underutilized. And this is the part that we will be interested in now. We want to optimize and redevelop land that is currently underutilized. Okay, now the million dollar question. What is an on block? And why do you go for on block? What can we on block? And so what are some of the failed mega on block sites? and the reasons for their failure and how do we identify on-block properties. Now, on-block is really very, very Singaporean. We are so uniquely Singaporeans. Nowhere in the world do you find this uh, such a huge law, you know, statutory law governing on-block sales. And it is really, what is a collective sale agreement, an on-block agreement? It is a binding agreement amongst uh, all the owners of a strata development on how they should behave in selling their strata units to one single developer. Remember, the key word here is unity of intentions. That means you, if your development comprises about 100 owners, at least 80 of these owners have to have one single focus and they are unified in going for the goal. Okay. And this on-block sale is really the only supply of our freehold land in Singapore because, as you all know, freehold land in Singapore is very scarce. All of the uh, GLS sites that actually have come onto the market or any other site um, that the government is selling are usually either on a 30-year, 60 years or 99-year tenures. So why do we go for on-block? We go for an on-block because we want to obtain a premium. If you, if you do not go for on-block, you can sell at a certain amount. But if you do go for, go for an on-block, there is a huge 
margin to be made if everybody sells collectively. Also, people go for on block to cash out and because if your building is really, really very old, time to put it into the recycling bin, then because you don't want to really spend money to upgrade it, then you also consider the on block path. You find that older buildings also go for on block because they have lost out on competition. Most of the older, for example, the older shopping centres, you find that other shopping centres, like say in Orchard Road, they are getting about $30 per square foot, but the older ones are maybe getting about $5, $8. And this is really true, because if you look at, let's say, um, uh, triple, uh, 333 Somerset, you, the developers there are getting about $20 per square foot, but you just go across the road, uh, Orchard Plaza, um, and these are all strata title individual units. You can actually lease out a unit there for as low as $6, $7 per square foot. One of the reasons is also because the building has age. There is no, uh, there is no one single owner who has the capacity to manage and do a, um, and to and to ensure a good tenant mix. So you find that in the older shopping centres, they they have actually lost a good, uh, uh, good returns. Okay, so if I sell individually, I only get a certain amount. But if I join up with all my neighbours, I get a lot more money. So what land value is really the, the, the main factor that creates intense interest in the land. And your premiums for on block, currently it ranges from about 20 to 30% because as you know, development charges actually creams off quite a lot of premium from on block sales. And some properties are really lucky, they get even more than 50%. But in the good old days of on block, in, let's say uh, pre-2008, I think people can even look at a 100% premium. That means double. So what can we unblock here? For sure, HDB is one of them. They have the SERS program, Selective Redevelopment, okay, HDB. We can also unblock HUDC, and there, were, there are a couple of HUDC unblocks that have come onto the market but did not succeed. As you know, all know, HD, HUDC estates are actually quite massive. Non-landed private residential, which is uh, the norm. Um, most of these are, are strata titled uh, apartments. Landed private residential can also go collective, but the difficulty here is trying to get 100% consensus. Shopping centres, definitely, because there are a lot of old shopping centres in Singapore that is time to really uh, 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 recycle them. Industrial buildings, we have actually handled quite a few industrial buildings and certainly the flatted factories are really very obsolete now. Most of the industrial buildings are actually very nice, swanky, uh, in fact can look as good as a grade A office building in Singapore. And office blocks also can be unblocked. Okay. It is, however, Despite all these opportunities here, the failure rate is fantastic. The on-block failure rate is two out of three. So if you manage to get a windfall from the on-block, it is really something good. Okay? And most of the collective sales in the past three years have failed also because of uh, the tightening, the cooling measures that the government has imposed on the market. So what are the, some of the failed collective sales that have happened in Singapore? Uh, I start from 2010, Hawaii Tower in uh, Mayer Road failed. Uh, asking price, 700 million, but it was very unfortunate at that time because the government started putting, uh, you know, tr uh, aiming cooling measures at the residential property market. So timing was not right. Tangling Shopping Centre failed also in 2010 and they have actually come onto the market uh, at, at least another two times uh, after that. But one of the reasons also because the asking price was a bit ridiculous. It, it, the problem is that there are a lot of owner occupiers there who cannot find replacement units elsewhere uh, from, the, from, from the returns that will, they will get from this on block. Okay? Faber Gardens in 2011 also failed. <clears throat> they had no bids, asking price also too high, unrealistic. 
Laguna Park failed two times. Um, why? Because there was when they launched it, the market sentiment was really bad, and the, again the government had put another blow to the to the residential market by um, imposing uh, seller stamp duty. Peace Centre, it was a mixed development comprising commercial office and um, residential, failed also because the price tag was too high. Peace Centre was a 99-year uh, property and at that time, DC charges were also very high because the, the developer had to pay a very high differential premium to top up the lease. Pine Grove, in 2011 failed. Asking price was 1.7 B. And uh, this was really, really unrealistic. And why? Because the valuation only came up to about 1.25 B. And at the same time, I think the market sentiment was not quite there also. Park Lane Shopping Mall failed also in 2012. They were not able to achieve the 80% consensus. And I will come to that later because I think the dynamics of your ownership actually comes into play here. Park West 2012 failed, asking price of 803 million, no bids received, and um, market sentiment was also poor. Thompson View, unfortunate, this was really unfortunate. Uh, they actually found a buyer, but it failed after going to, 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 to the High Court because of bad faith. Um, and I will come to that later also because in a collective sale, there has to be full transparency. Harborview Gardens also failed because of bad faith. Now, this is a small one. They actually found a buyer in 2013. It was really unfortunate because uh, the people... It, it's, a, it's only a very small on collective sale, but it failed because of bad faith. And uh, the recent one that failed was Yunosville. Uh, 688 million. As you all know, the, mar the residential market was really weak and uh, very hard to find uh, bidders in this kind of weak residential market. Um, the other collective sales that actually uh, did not find buyers were like Arcade, which is a shopping centre, an office block in uh, Raffles Place. Okay. So these were. So what are the ingredients for? a very successful collective sale. First, we have to look at the URA's master plan. So what we do is we compare the master plan with the future land use plan of Singapore. Okay? And then we look, thirdly, at the new and extended railway lines. So if there is a, if there is a, a MRT which is coming to your doorstep, something good will probably happen to your property. Even if it doesn't have the collective sale potential, your property would have gone up in value already. And then we look at urban renewal because there are a lot of properties that actually is really old and obsolete and uh, time to, to really demolish and, and build a new one there. We look at the market cycle. So we can, we can always go for, go for a collective sale, but if the timing is not right, and you know you you launch it it is it, it's really a waste of time and effort so very importantly when you are ready the market has to be ready if the market is not ready and you are ready no point okay and then we look at the ownership dynamics ownership dynamics basically means who are the people who actually make up the the the, the development are they keen to go for a collective sale do you have a single stakeholder that owns more than 20% uh, 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 of share values in, your, in the development? It, it does help when you have a majority stakeholder as well. And then we look at all those people who have to look for replacement units. Is it difficult to find replacement? Is it expensive to find replacement units? So now I come to the first point, the master plan. You all know that the master plan is our is Singapore's statutory land, year, uh, land use plan which actually guides development over five-year periods. Okay? It shows your permissible land use and intensity for developments. It translates your broad-term, long-term strategies of the concept plan and it is also comprehensive, forward-looking and it gives you an integrated planning framework to balance our land use needs. Now, this is the master plan 
in Singapore, the latest master plan, you'll find that it is actually divided into five regions, your central, east, northeast, north region and the west region. So currently it is still a, a bit of a mess, uh, but the government is trying to straighten it out now. So concentrating um, residential in the, in the central part of Singapore and then uh, industrial will probably happen at the, at the western region and some in the north and some in the extreme east. Okay. Now this is our future land use plan. You find that, sorry I can only point this side, cannot point that side. So um, in the future land use plan, you find that population will be concentrated basically in the central areas of Singapore and this is really from the, from the slight west, the northern west to the east and then we have the central corridor. Currently, two-thirds of our population is actually concentrated in the central corridor of Singapore. So you find that every day, if you live in Ang Mo Kio or Bishan or Yishun, you find that you're stuck in a jam because, because two-thirds of our population is actually concentrated in the central region. So what the government is trying to do now is trying to, sorry, to put population back and spread it evenly in the north northeastern zone, a bit in the east and a bit over here. So I think this is what they are planning to do to spread the population out a little bit more. So this is our commercial in and in and industrial clusters in the year 2030, and and this actually gives you a a, a bit of an insight on what is going to happen by the year 2030. You find that the main the main commercial area, of course, is the central area here. And then we get little, little clusters in Pai Leba, in the East Coast, Marine Parade, Kalang Riverside. We have got a business park in Tampines, another commercial cluster in Woodlands. Of course, Jurong is another one. And of course, Bona Vista, we have our research areas here. Okay, and Alexandra as well. So this will give you an inkling of what, what will happen, where the commercial clusters are. And uh, of course, with all these commercial clusters, you also get a very good, uh, comprehensive uh, rail and uh, transport lines. Okay. Then we look at our new and extended MRT lines. You know that when an MRT line comes to your doorstep, something good is going to happen. Either your property may, may have a change in zoning from residential to commercial, or you might have an increase in your plot ratio. Okay. Or the other bad thing that could happen is that they can acquire your, bill, your, your property, and that's really bad news. Um, so if you have, uh, if you, if, if you're going to be near an MRT station, um, it is really a good thing. So you find that the government is going to have an ambitious plan to increase our rail network, doubling it from 178 kilometers to about 360 kilometers. Okay, so we are going to have at least two more new rail lines, which is the Juro Region Line and the Cross Island Line. And by 2030, 8 in 10 households will be within a 10-minute walk of a railway station. So that's really good news. And then we need to, another factor to consider on block is going for urban renewal. No price to guess <laughs> what building is this, but, uh, but this one very hard to go on block. Um, there's a there's a good opportunity though, but very difficult because multiple owners and foreign ownership as well. So we need to really, because this is quite an eyesore, in in a in a beautiful urban landscape along the along the river and in a, along Nickel Highway, uh, you get beautiful buildings. You know Marina Bay Sands, uh, SunTech City, and then you have Gateway and. And then, of course, the future duo is going to be built there. And then you get this golden mouth tower. <laughs> so this is really an eyesore. And the thing is that if, if they do not make an effort to maintain this, the government may come in to do something because it does spoil the urban landscape of Singapore. 
So you find that the reasons also people go for collective sale, not only to change the urban landscape, but you get buildings which are really obsolete, you get, you get leaking pipes, um, spalling concrete, lifts that break down all the time, you know, and then for some buildings you get unsavoury characters living in there because your rent has dropped so much. Uh, and this is true of uh, certain residential buildings like in Chinatown or uh, Pearl Bank and that kind of thing. So you get a lot of um, police raids and stuff like that. So buildings like that, time to go collective, but very difficult. Okay, next factor we have to consider is our property market cycle. Like I said, if you are, if, if you are ready to on block, you manage to get your 80% consensus and then the market is not ready because we got weak market sentiment, no point. You would have wasted all your effort. Okay? So this is our 10-year property market cycle in Singapore from 2004 till today. So let's look at how the market has performed. From 2004, which is actually the post.com crash, we had positive economic growth. And uh, it was fantastic. The, the market was good, there was, there was money, there was a strong bull run in equities and there was a lot of money flow into the, uh, flowed into the real estate. And then come 2008, we had our global financial crisis. It was really bad. And I think at that point in time, a lot of people were out of a job. Uh, the market, people could not get loans and stuff like that. And the market actually tumbled a lot, a lot, okay? That, but the funny thing is that it only happened for the, the global financial crisis was very quickly arrested in like about a year to 18 months. However, the damage had actually been done. Uh, the recovery came, the, the, most of the recovery came in the last quarter of 2009. And you find that if you had bought a real estate here, it would have gone up more than 60% today okay so a lot of it the this bull run in the market actually caught a lot of people uh, by surprise in fact all the smart savvy boutique fund managers they come to tell me oh christina you know i missed the market we thought that the market was going to be worse after the after the global financial crisis and the recovery was going to be very bad but we did not expect this so a lot of them had actually missed the market so but those people who had money to invest, they were very clever. They bought this at this point and it's gone up by more than 60%. So you find that when the market, when, when because of monetary easing, uh, ease of getting loans and stuff like that, interest rates were very low, uh, you know, even below 1%. And then there was, a, there was a huge sharp spike in property prices. So... This was when the government felt they had to put a stop to all this. Okay, so from 2011 onwards, we had one blow after another, the, especially the residential market. You know, for of the property cooling, multiple rounds of cooling measures. We had first the SSD, and then we had the, and then we had the uh, ABSD, and it appeared that it didn't even stop people from from investing. So even at this stage, the market was going up, but at a much slower pace. So the government felt that, you know, it shouldn't be like that. So come 2012, we were hit with the mother of all cooling measures, and that was the TDSR. So TDSR is actually showing its effect now. You find that the market is slowly turning down. But the government feels that we have not corrected enough yet, so that we saw most of the measures are still in place, and uh, you know. But a lot of people, investors, are still playing a wait and see a game. So, property market cycle very important for your collective sale. If anybody was thinking of unblocking their property, it would be a good time to start now, because the the when you are ready, because an unblock sale doesn't happen overnight. The gestation period for an unblock unblock a uh, uh, um, exercise is about two years so it is really a good time to start now to start doing your, your background work now then we come to ownership dynamics you find that 
there are certain uh, 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 properties in Singapore that are owned by large institutions, especially for some buildings, like for example, Orchard Plaza, I think at least 28% of the units are owned by Far East. And then, of course, you've got other shopping centres, for example, Katong Shopping Centre, about 30-odd percent owned by city developments and stuff like that. So it, it does help when you have a motivated uh, single stakeholder there. Now, who are, your own, who are the uh, owners in the building? Are they investors? You find that investors are more willing to take on the collective sale because for them, it is basically realizing their, their, the, the capital gains and then moving on to something else. Or are they owner-occupiers? The owner-occupiers are less inclined to unblock their properties because they have difficulty in finding replacements. Okay, what is your level of support for the collective sale? If you find, most people would usually go by a, um, they would send out a questionnaire and then they would do a poll to find out what, what is uh, generally everybody's opinion on an on block and how much, what is their expectation as well. So it is a good way to start this, you know, do a poll. Then from the poll, you'll find out whether people are realistic or unrealistic. So, but you, the general consensus is that you'll find people to be unrealistic in their expectations, okay? So you get all types of people. The first type, you have, I have no opinion, I will go with the majority. These are actually the worst types because they sit on the fence. Uh, they will not sign your collective sale agreement and then, you know, they do not object also. So, but you cannot get, get them in, you know, to, 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 to join the majority. And then you get some that think that they are sitting on a gold mine and then they say, why, you know, the, 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 the margin is not enough for them. Why sell so low? Why sell now? Why, why, why? And then you get those who absolutely will not sell. No, 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 no. Because uh, my, my father left this property to me, you know, or, you know, it is my, uh, my matrimonial home or, you, you know, my, my grandfather's spirit is still hanging around here. So you find that they absolutely will not sell. And these people usually will be the most violent objectors, even though they have got no valid grounds to object and then of course you get the other category who is waiting for a windfall okay so I think you have to really look at your ownership dynamics so now after looking at all these I want to just give you one of our rec a recent case study which is handled by Cushman and Wakefield um, we we did this uh, in fact in this in the uh, process of being uh, uh, completed um, this is number three, Irving Road. We actually did this collective sale. We started uh, in the beginning of this year, had our EGM. And uh, you'll find that this is an industrial building comprising 67 uh, units. Uh, what's so great about this rotten industrial building or what we used to call flattered factories? Now, this is really located in the heart of Pai Leba. And as you all know, the Pai Leba story, two years uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the August uh, National Day message, uh, PM Lee has already targeted Pai Leba to be an eye park. And uh, it is to, to house, you know, some of our, our huge local SMEs. So what they did was they changed the the master plan of Pai Le Ba, okay? Now, you find that in 2003, this is Irving. In 2003, in the master plan, Irving Industrial Building at number 3 Irving Road only had a plot ratio of 2.5, which is typical of any industrial flattered factory. Now, in the master plan of 2008, after coming up with the Pai Le Ba I Park blueprint, the Number three, Irving had a rezoning to a plot ratio of 3.5 with a minimum of uh, B1. B1 space is your industrial space, your clean industrial space. You have to build a minimum B1 space of 2.5 and you are left with a one white. 
this is a real windfall because why? Your one white, you can do anything. You can you can put you put retail space. You can put medical suites. Of course, all subject to 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 URA's approval. You can do office space. Uh, you can do anything. You know, for white. So it allows the developer to be very creative, to build a nice uh, a, a B1 uh, space with a nice shopping center even. So this was a real windfall for all my 67 owners in Irving Industrial Building. And you realize that because what's happened is that if you remain as, a, as your industrial building of 2.5 plot ratio, you will never be able to unlock the potential of the white. Never. So I had, we had a wonderful sale committee. We had very cooperative owners. All had all were very unified in their intention. They wanted to unlock their potential in this building, okay? And the only way is to go collective. So we did the collective sale for them. Just to give you an idea of how much they make, now, they had, Irving had a site area about 65,000 square feet. If each owner were to sell individually in the market without the potential of a collective sale, they would very likely only get about $725 per square foot for their flatted factory space. Now, the on-block value achieved after on-blocking, we got $1,139 per square foot for them. It represented a 57% premium over current market values. So this is how people really, really get their windfall. Okay. So in summary, on-block sales are guided by the Strata Titles Board, governed by the Land Titles Strata Act. Numerous factors that we have to look for, look out for. The URA's master plan, what is our future land use plan? What are the new and extended railway lines? And is it time to, to put your building into the recycling bin? And then we look at the market cycle and we look at ownership dynamics. So we remember the sale process, the gestation period for a collective sale is really very long. It takes, for some, it takes almost three years to realize this profit and it can be fraught with pitfalls such as bad faith. So I think for an on block to really succeed, all these ingredients should be really present and uh, import most importantly, a sense of ethics and morality has to surround every single on block deal. You need to have very motivated people, you need to have a very good sale committee to represent you and then you, of course, need to have a good real estate agent as well as a good lawyer to advise you. And once all these ingredients are there, you are ready for a collective sale. And hopefully, the market will be ready for you as well. So with that, I end my talk today. Thank you so much.